there is a cynical feeling around Chelsea at the moment and it's engineered and it's come through the decision makers at Chelsea. For Chelsea fans point of view you'd hope that this season will be able to maybe build on what we did from back in the last season but with new manager, new philosophy, new system, new players who knows what we're going to do this year. Welcome along to 90 Min. Welcome to your 2024-25 Chelsea preview. This is a new series on 90 Min, Scott, where we dig deeper into the Premier League's biggest clubs ahead of the new season. Scott, what you wanted to do? Why am I here? <laughs> As a Man United fan, why are you here? I'm not sure. We needed four people. We have two Chelsea fans with us, though. Jacob Holshaw, Scott Saunders, Kwaku Afari, and son of Chelsea. We didn't, couldn't, what are you, the brother of Chelsea? Brother of Chelsea, <laughs> come on. <laughs> <laughs> we got Dan Childs back in the studio. Now, Dan, we, we just had to say, it's great to see you back. Last time you were here was in the old studio, sort of surroundings, all yeah. good? Yeah, lovely. Lovely scene. Feeling, feeling comfortable? Yeah. Heating's not too much? Okay. No, no, it's perfect. Okay, <laughs> nice one. Okay, lot to get through about Chelsea going into the new season. Obviously, the new manager under Enzo Maresca. Um, Quakey, I wanted to cross over to you first in terms of comparing last season versus the new season. Yeah. Just give us your feelings about last season under Maurizio Pochettino and your feelings about how things ended at the club. Um, so obviously, former Spurs manager, it takes a lot for you to kind of forget that. But by the end of the season, we did forget that. Um, he's got everybody on board. Um, Chelsea had some great results towards the back end of the season. It seemed like we were all going in the right direction. And then the bombshell happened that he's leaving the football club. We don't still know whether it's more to do with him, more to do with the board, but parted ways and Chelsea had to start again and I compare it to like do you watch TV series? Yeah. Like true watch TV. Yeah, you watch TV. <laughs> so like True Detective is an anthology, right? So no season bleeds into another. They're each individual stories. And that's what Chelsea is, right? It's we have a season under a manager, it's really good, it's really bad, and next season's completely different with new personnel, um, as opposed to being a continual series. And is that's true detective season two any good? No, it's not. Okay, the, so the, I only saw the one. Season one's one of the best TV okay, shows of all time. Back. No, don't yet. Yeah, okay. You don't need to. Season one's <laughs> absolutely incredible um, if you haven't watched it. But Chelsea, I, I, I wish Chelsea was season one of True Detective. We're like season three of True Detective, which nobody needs to see. And last season finished sixth, despite the fact that we finished 12th the year before. It was it was seen as an improvement, but I really expect Chelsea to push on under Michel Pochettino because he kind of got the players that he wanted to, or he got a place to play the football that he wanted, got them all singing off the same hymn sheet. And despite the fact that there was troubles within the season, you think about the incident when it came to the penalty against Everton where the players kind of argued, but he really laid down the law and it seemed like he had the authority in the dressing room. And so the fact that he was let go, he was allowed to walk out the door, really, it doesn't bode well for this new season. We've got Maresca in at the moment. We don't know how he's going to be, but talking to some Leicester fans who did win the league last year in the championship, it doesn't seem like we've got the man that, that will be able to unite the dressing room. And, and for Chelsea fans' point of view, you'd hope that this season will be able to maybe build on what we did from back in the last season. But with new manager, new philosophy, new system, new players, who knows what we're going to do this year. Uh, Dan, finished sixth last season. Um, Pochettino left. Maresk has come in. How much of a gamble is this, though, for Chelsea uh, with Enzo Maresca going into the new season? And what you've seen so far in pre-season as well? Oh, it's absolutely huge. Uh, it's a huge gamble on a guy who doesn't have a lot of experience, a, a big track record. Um, he's someone that, despite yeah working alongside uh, Pep Guardiola for a, a little bit of time uh, in his own coaching, you know, CV, there's there's not a lot to go by. Um, you know, you've got to factor in dis despite the success at Leicester, Leicester had a massive financial advantage over everyone else in that league. Uh, because of the parachute payments, because to be honest, we were expected that James Madison was going to leave even if they stayed up. Mm -hmm. So when you actually look at the squad, it wasn't like they were absolutely gutted and all of their best players were sold. Um, and of course, the despite Leicester, of course, having some big success in, in the past decade, the scrutiny on Leicester is always different to the scrutiny at Chelsea and any big club, right? So to hand him a five plus one, I don't know what the plus one does. I don't know if it's like some magical thing that <laughs> means that he's going to be a success rather than not. Um, Cause that, that was really the thing that sold him. You know, the five years wasn't enough when they gave him the plus one. He's like, yeah, okay, okay, we went to six. Why isn't um, it seven or eight? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if there's a coaching amortization or something, something <laughs> going on here. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it, there isn't a lot that, from my point of view, convinces me about Enzo Maresca. Um, I, I don't personally, on a wider point, feel that this obsession that we have to play positional kind of possession-based football is always what it's touted to be, especially if you're not Pep Guardiola, if you don't boast some of the best players in the world. Um, and especially 
because of the chaos that we know ensues Chelsea and engulfs it every single year. If you're not given the time to instill that, which I don't think Maresca should or will be given because of the situation Chelsea are in, it, it kind of feels like a little bit of a, a just misguided, I think, is kind of the general feeling at Chelsea. Can I ask you about you guys about the emotional attachment you currently have to Chelsea? Yeah. Because Poch was obviously, he did a good job on the whole last season. Mm. Obviously, he had the Spurs thing previously. And like you said at the, at, at the start of the show, like it was always there, but he got to a point where most fans were on his side, I would yeah. say. And then Chelsea decided, this isn't the guy for us. We're going to replace him with somebody else. Whether that was down to Poch wanting more power and, di- and being able to dictate the club's direction, how does that make you feel? Emotional t- um, attachment is dictated by two things for me, anyway. The first thing is winning, and the reason why Chelsea were so emotionally attached to previous managers like Jose Mourinho, who were winning trophies. The reason why Chelsea fans to this day are still emotionally attached to Roman Abramovich is because he won countless trophies. And the second thing is the players. And over the last few years, we've seen Chelsea sell Academy products. The 1920 season, despite the fact Chelsea didn't win anything, was one of my favourite ever Chelsea seasons because Frank Lampard was our manager, obviously a Chelsea legend. We had Mason Mount coming through, uh, Fukai Tamori, Tammy Abraham, Reese James. The Cobham Cubs were coming through. We, even Billy Gilmore to an extent. I know that we signed him from Rangers when he was like 14 or 15, but so he was still a, an Academy product. And that attachment has been severed. And as a result of that, if you're a Chelsea fan, in the midst of Conor Gallagher potentially leaving to go to Atletico Madrid, you feel very, very numb to it, very, very, very detached. And I don't know if, if you can speak about the same thing, Dan, but I right now at Chelsea, this is the most numb I've felt. Mm. I don't go to the games home and away anymore that I used to back in the day. But despite that, I wasn't going home and away in the 1920 season under Frank Lampard, but I felt there was an emotional attachment to the football club. And what Chelsea did over the Roman Bramovich tenure was win trophies consistently. And that paper over the cracks. But in football, it's just about winning, right? And the reason why Chelsea was so successful is because we won trophies despite the fact that we wouldn't have necessarily the strongest league seasons. And this board has not delivered that. There's no attachment in terms of players that we've got right now. There's there's a host of players that we don't really have any affiliation to. And so if you ask me about how I feel as a Chelsea fan, I feel numb right now. Mm-hmm. And so wait and see situation. But yeah. before Dan... If you beat Man City on the opening day, then we're back on the train, back. back on the gravy train. Yeah, back on the gravy train. And if Chelsea would have won the the League Cup final against against Liverpool, it would have been yeah. Football's about winning, yeah. and and we can't mm-hmm. deny that. And Nan talked about the the style of play for Chelsea because we were birthed in in terms of the recent success of Chelsea over the last twenty years, birthed in the image of Jose Mourinho. It's never been about performances. It's never been about style of play. It's mm-hmm. been about winning trophies. We are not a Man United, Liverpool, Arsenal where winning's not just you can't just win. You've got to win a certain type of way. And that's why Jose Mourinho didn't work at Manchester United. That's why Emery didn't work at Arsenal. That's why Klopp really worked at Liverpool because they're not just winning, they're winning in certain ways. But these are these are the heritage clubs of the Premier League. In terms of Chelsea, it's just about winning. We've had managers do it in style in terms of Carlo Ancelotti. We've had managers do it in a pragmatic style in terms of um, Conte or Jose Mourinho. It's just about getting the trophy at the end of the season and we've not done that in recent years. Dan, talk to us about how you're feeling at this moment in the transfer window and also in pre-season as well because there's a backdrop of Conor Gallagher potentially moving to Atletico Madrid. Uh, we look at some of the pre-season results falling 4-0 down in two of the pre-season games against Celtic and Manchester City. Um, there's been a couple of questions about Enzo Maresca's style of play, personnel as well. Yeah. What's your overall feeling at this point, You know, two week, less than two weeks now until the opener against City? Yeah, I, I don't think that the negative emotion and kind of vibe that probably people outside of Chelsea are getting is 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 wrong and kind of uh, over overblown because anecdotally everyone I speak to and I, I you know I'm in a group with Chelsea fans who more than me literally and they're already discussing where they're going to be going for the conference league this year so it's not despite their mm. annoyance and frustration they will still be spending thousands of pounds to travel up and down not only the length of this country but the length of the continent to follow Chelsea so any question about their legitimate support about Chelsea you know the gaslighting that's gone on this summer has been remarkable over that trying to dismiss the negativity and concern as like Chelsea fans like myself and others are just coming out of it with thin air like all of this criticism has come just because people want to be negative maybe in some cases and that can stretch a little bit too far but there is a cynical feeling around Chelsea at the moment and it's engineered and it's come through the decision makers at Chelsea they're the people responsible for the atmosphere that has been created around Chelsea there, there's no two ways about it you can blame social media you can blame uh, certain fans and individuals or maybe actions that could have happened um, but the, the fact is the decision since basically parting ways of Pochettino has 
blown up this summer as a comical mess. I mean, it has been a farce. Like the 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 move from there to then appoint Enzo Maresca, we just spoke about Neil Barth and Jim Fraser to massive monumental these are not just like random staff leaving the club this is these are people especially in the case of Neil Bath people who orchestrated and led the the brilliance that is Cobham and um, those two people leaving they are monumental figures and then when you add on top of that Emma Hayes leaving this summer uh, Pochettino obviously leaving and the, the massive length of institutional knowledge that has left that club since the summer of 2022 the, again, it all builds up into even people, I think, more positive and negative this summer have looked at just the facts and gone, well, there's a reason we're concerned here. So even before getting to transfers, which is an, another can of worms in itself, because, you know, it, my question consistently this summer is what is the point of a transfer window? You know, I think all of us, whether it's Man United, whether it's Watford, whether it's Chelsea, whether it's Arsenal, whoever it is, I think as fans, we, we walk into a transfer window and we go, OK, the point of this transfer window is to walk out of it with a stronger squad. I know our lengths of finances and every club situation is different, right? But especially for Chelsea, the idea is, okay, can we upgrade on certain positions? Because the season did add strongly and I didn't think we need major, you know, revolution with this squad. I thought it was difficult to judge the quality because we had so many injuries. It's still difficult to judge the true extent and ceiling of this current squad. But the, the PSR nonsense that it feels like more and more Chelsea's transfer business is about dodging financial repercussions or I don't know, it feels at times like I'm watching the sporting directors put in some kind of uni dissertation theory into, into Chelsea's transfer window, you know, it, rather than, you know, it's, it's nice theory and, you know, not to ramble, but it's like there's, there's also a point about this where I think that there's a cynicism that comes from the Clear Lake and Iqbali side of this that, that, is aided by the sporting directors, but the sporting directors have come from a level of club like Brighton and Monaco, especially Brighton, where it's okay to lose your best players. It's okay not to win trophies. And that's not me having to go at Brighton. That's just like the reality of football. And I'm not saying that buying cheap and selling for high is, is a bad idea, um, but they're buying as if Chelsea are not the club they are. Like I, I always say this, that it's almost like Clear Lake think they can take a men, in, a men in Black memory pen and wipe everyone's memory of what Chelsea have been for the past 20 years. Um, you can't do that. And, and that's just the reality. And when you're spending a billion and fans see that and then they look at the squad and they look at the squad, particularly this summer, where it's got weak and not stronger, how are they supposed to react and go, well, this is absolutely fine. You know, we're, we're, we'll just, we'll sit back, we'll take it. And th there's a cynicism that has created that separation, which is which is absolutely real. Can I can I just ask Dan a question yeah. a minute? And um, just, if there's fans of other clubs watching this now, mm. the the habit is to like throw the book at Todd Bowley. Yeah. What, so who's in charge here? So really the, the, the pa for the first summer, it really, and I remember, I think it was the first time I was on 90 Min. That was the, the summer of 22 and I was talking about the that was when Bowley really was the interim sorting director and and I think that summer has created a media perception that Todd Bowley is basically like the guy running things he's almost like the new Abramovich in a sense like he's the guy that everyone attaches and, and uh, kind of a household football name at this point but pretty much since last summer and even before then the power players at Chelsea have bade Eddie Bowley because Clear Lake in this consortium own more of a share that they have more power in this current uh, um, ownership. igbali has been running things. And then below him, you have Paul Wynn Stanley and Lawrence Stewart. And um, there are other figures, it, it, but those are the three power players. There's a picture of all three of them at Nottingham Forest that you can find. Those are the people responsible for the key decisions at Chelsea. Um, that's not to say that Bowley and other people in Chelsea's hierarchy bear no responsibility because they're attached to it. But the idea that there's still perception that runs in a lot of ways that Bowley is out there, like you, know, you hear the phrases, kid in a, a sweet shop, you know, going across um, the world trying to sign these players. That just not, it's not relevant on, on what Chelsea is. That probably was the case in the summer of 22 and maybe a little bit heading into 2023, but that's just not accurate anymore. The, these are the people that are responsible for the key decisions at Chelsea now. And, and that's who people's frustration should be aimed at, really. And, and, and you know, for outside people that don't follow Chelsea, um, that's the accurate reflection. But it's, you know, it's, I know that there will still be, you know, uh, Bowley on, on the headline of every Chelsea, you know, um, article about our, our strategy and they'll talk as if Bowley is again the guy leading it because in a, in a way I think Bowley's smart and when Stanley and Stuart are smart because they don't have 
a public profile like Bowley does. Bowley goes to these press conferences and he speaks about Chelsea. Yeah. So naturally, that's where that link is created, even though the reality is obviously very different. But Chelsea also paying for the sins of that transfer window, though. If you look at the yeah. players that are brought in, Cucurella, Raheem Sterling, Wesley Fofana, like those mm. are signings that are irresponsible if, you, if you're not qualified to make those decisions. And that's when Bowley was making the decisions. Mm. What you talked about in terms of the institutional knowledge that left the football club is everything. Because we talk about it as proper Chelsea, or we understand what it means to be Chelsea, and that's left the building. And it there is no identity of the football club anymore. Whether it's the playing style, whether it's the way that we operate in the transfer window, whether it's the way we operate as a football club. Like institutionally, behind the scenes, it's a mess. And I know some people who worked at the Chelsea and have have exposed the fact that it is an absolute mess. It was a column of staff when they first came in. It's very, very callous as well. Um, it's done in a very cold way. And for me as a football fan, obviously you're going to support your team no matter what, but there's, a, there's an attachment as a result of the way that they've operated over the last two or three seasons and if you're not matching it with results because let's be honest there was a callousness and the coldness to the way that Roman Bramovich ran Chelsea Football Club as well but we delivered yeah. when it came to to winning trophies and no matter what manager came through the door they were still going to win trophies I remember the the season the 18-19 season under Sarri where Chelsea finished third and won the, uh, won the Europa League and lost in the League Cup final and that was viewed as a disaster that was viewed as a terrible season those were the standards and we talked in previous video how he was talking about those Falcons standards there's no, there's no standards at Chelsea anymore. there isn't <laughs> <laughs> also, I think that 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 Sarri season, right, and the Lampard season that came, you know, back to back. I think they're a great reflection on. I agree with you. That, you know, you talk about winning, and you know, we can talk about what what Chelsea was. You know, what Chelsea should be because financially, there's there's a very harsh reality uh, that I think a lot of people need to face about Chelsea. Chelsea need Champions League football desperately. But that's a side point. But those two seasons also reflected that to, to fans, to football fans, it is more about it's, it's more than just about winning. It's yes. about if you're not winning, if your club, the thing about that 1920 season was that I think there was an acceptance in that summer that sure a connection had been lost. There was a almost like a toxic civil war online between Chelsea fans that has never really been repaired since. Um, and with the transfer ban, there was kind of an acceptance that, okay, things could be more difficult this year than usual. But because there was Lampard in the dugout and whatever you think about him as a coach, that season, he produced Great, some actually really good attacking football when you actually go back and look at it. I think Lampard's 1920 season, I'm not talking about anything after that, has actually looked better as we've got further away from it, to be honest. But And the crop of those youngsters, because fans were going to the bridge and they were seeing a team that, you know, reflected something. There was, there was at least something to cling on to. The loss of Eden Hazard as well. Yeah. yeah that was the first season yeah. without, without Eden. It was, I completely agree, if you juxtapose those two seasons, on the face of it, the season under Sarri was better, right? Yeah. Finished third and won the trophy and got to final of another one. Under Lampard, I remember we losing the FA Cup final. We were gutted because mm. we wanted to see those Cobham Cubs lift that silverware. But there was a sense of optimism and a sense of we're going in the right direction. And the next summer, we managed to spend, or we went and spent so much money on players that there was mixed results. We obviously brought in Thiago Silva, brought in Kai Havertz, Timo Werner, Hakim Ziyech. Um, we went big, but it was just a different feeling around the football club in comparison to when we went big maybe a season or two ago where it was like, how good is Enzo Fernandez, or how good are these players that we're bringing in? I just feel like there's a lack of direction in the football club. Should we talk about the transfer window, Scott, um, in terms of Chelsea? Because Dan touched upon it there that, you know, we mentioned the backdrop around Conor Gallo. We mentioned the backdrop around a number of signings, the running saga, really, that's gone on throughout this window. Um, probably the sim most simple question is do you think Chelsea will get what they need? in this window. What and do Chelsea need? They have... That's how many players do they have? I saw a graphic going around on Twitter the other day where it listed every single player Chelsea have on their books and there were two goalkeepers there and they have about six. Mm. And I was like, you have all these players already. Like, surely you can find a solution within this group of players. But it, it still seems to me like... I like Nicholas Jackson. I think I think he's a good... He offers a really good option, but I do have concerns about how prolific he's going to be. You know, he does seem to waste a lot of chances and I thought that was a problem that he would face af after being signed from Villarreal as well. So I'm thinking like, Chelsea had injury problems last season. So maybe you see like Wesley Fofana stepping back in and fulfilling potential that we thought he had when he was at Leicester. But what, what did Chelsea actually need this summer? Um, that that was kind of my big feeling at the start of the summer. Um, not for a ch cheap plug, but I did write on my sub stack. You can go and subscribe to it. Um, <laughs> yeah, make sure to follow that. Make sure to subscribe. All that good um, stuff. Links in the description. All that good stuff. That I think, you know, at times Chelsea, and, and this is just proven consistently, Chelsea's biggest obstacle and enemy in the transfer window is themselves. Um, and I, I kind of looked at the squad and just felt, yeah, like, there are some like fancy names out there. That, and I'm not, Michael Elise was the one that I yeah. kind of looked at and went, 
okay, in a lot of ways, this doesn't make sense because we bought every single left footed right winger in the world. Yeah. But however, John Anthony. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, on top of but on top of that, like the he's gone. Ineos. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Palming off yeah, players, yeah, love yeah, yeah. or not even. Yeah, uh, maybe great. Clear Luck and Ineos can kind of uh, you know combine together <laughs> oh, to create man. some like really evil. Do you know uh, like the Batman, Batman Superman film? That's a hell of a Marvel movie. movie. Yeah. 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 Terrible, Idiot terrible. Awesome yeah. <laughs> oh, man. But, sorry, um, Dan, sorry, Dan. Uh, no, I, I think that the, the Elise one was a great example of like, that guy would have upgraded what we had in that area. Like mm. he was just a great talent, obviously was once part of Chelsea's academy as kind of everyone is. Um, and... I thought, yeah, it was a real upgrade on, on what we had. And that, you know, again, that's kind of the simple economics of transfers, right? You, mm. you think that, that that'd be a really good player for us. But I, I don't know. After a year of chasing him, we nearly signed him last summer. Apparently, Chelsea walked into the transfer negotiating and were absolutely stunned that a really good player wanted to be paid really good wages, which is just kind of like, again, simple transfer economics. Like, you know, if you want to buy the best players, unfortunately, you have to pay good money, which, mm. you know, um, is just a reality. So... In turn, I, Scott, I, I, I just, I, I don't think that it's as simple as well. We need this player, we need that player. Like, there's this really key area, um, because I think there's so much wrong in terms of the management of the players we currently have, the players we're selling, the players we're selling in the majority. I've got them written down here. We've sold uh, Ian Matson, Lewis Hall was already gone, Ziash, yeah, long gone, um, Malang Sar obviously never had a future at Chelsea, but obviously losing Thiago Silva. <laughs> Yeah. And Murray Hutchinson had a really good loan at Ipswich. And I think there was a lot of us who actually, other than Lise, maybe he could actually come in and be given a chance, but seemingly was was signed so long ago that the club forgot they actually had him. So have sold him on. And then obviously Conor Gallagher um, being sold and Trevor Chalaber likely being sold too. And even the idea that maybe Petrovic, who was our best goalkeeper last season. What? Yeah. yeah. No yeah. way, really? Well, the, yeah. the, 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 play. the idea is that the style of play is uh not suitable for Petrovic. So when did you did you sign Petrovic in the era of Yeah, we signed him last summer. Yeah. What so just 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 on this style of play that is gonna bring in Dan, because you sort of summed up the, the transfer end of things and it's, there's a lot going on there. We um, will do a separate transfer video. There'll be a transfer video on. but I just wanted to maybe just just going into the season preview Quake, it's gonna yeah. be a possession based approach, which mm. if I'm honest I probably wouldn't associate with Chelsea Football no. Club as being that style of play. A lot no. of people have likened Enzo Maresca, obviously, during his time with Pep Guardiola at Manchester City. Yeah. I mean, I saw it firsthand last season in terms of what he did at Leicester. And I thought, granted, they should have gone on to win the league as they did. It did feel at times, if I'm being honest, it felt quite rigid in yeah. the way he played. There's one way and it's going to be drilled in. My biggest issue with it, and I think one thing I must stress, there will be teething issues, I think, at mm. Chelsea. But will there be the patience from people at Chelsea, not only in the board, but at the fans as well, to give him the time to implement the style. It's not Chelsea heritage. So think about the, the stick that you used to beat Arsenal fans with is that you finish, I had to finish eighth and eighth and fifth and second and second. But in the second season where they finished eighth in Arteta's first full season, they sh they saw shoots of recovery. They saw positive play. Mm. And Arsenal fans had patience because it's about the style of play at Arsenal. That's what they've learned under, under Arsene Wenger. At Chelsea, genuinely, it's purely about results. The reason why Chelsea fans felt better about the back end of last season is because we were getting results. There was a lot of games where Chelsea played very well last year and didn't get results. And Chelsea fans were fuming because... Because of the way that we gained our success, it was about winning the big games. It was about winning the games and not in the most prettier fashion. The one outlier was the season under Carlo Ancelotti where we played incredible football in the 09-10 season, scored a lot of goals. And that was probably the most free-flowing Chelsea side I've seen. We saw Mauricio Sarri, a, player, a manager that tried to play progressive football and Chelsea fans weren't having it despite the fact that we, we were getting results towards the back end of the season. For Chelsea, it's about a manager getting results and also a manager conveying or connecting with the fans. And that's what Chelsea have always, that's why we, we still to this day love Thomas Tuchel. He connected with the fans in a way that managers mm. subsequent to him haven't done. That's the reason why when Frank Lampard was there, we absolutely loved him. That's the reason why Antonio Conte would always have a, a, a fond place in my heart and Jose Mourinho, of course. It's about connecting with the fans, it's about getting results. The style of play, to me, is secondary, man. Mm. I, I want to see my team win football matches because I can only go to Wembley so many times to see us lose. It's happened too much recently. And I just, for Chelsea fans, it doesn't matter how well we played against Liverpool in both the League Cup final and FA Cup final, we lost those games. And so 
for me, the style of play is much of nothing, really. Like, we're going to see the fullback and Vert. We're going to see Kieran Doosby Hall uh, play in, in positions that we haven't seen other Chelsea players play. But if we're not getting results, we won't care about it. If come October, November time, we're languishing mid-table, Chelsea fans will not care about inverting fullbacks. They'll care about the results or the lack of results. Do you see that way as well, well Dan? Y- yeah, and it's like, you talk about take the inverting fullback thing. If it means that Reese James is playing in central midfield, just re- recycling possession and not getting into an area where he's most effective, then what's the point? If it means that you start selling some of your best players to accommodate players like Robert Sanchez, who is a liability every time he steps on the pitch for Chelsea, like there's, what's the point of it? Like I don't, I don't, I don't really see, you know, it's 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 my fear about this kind of obsession over control, where. And the idea that the ideas of, of a certain style of play are so wonderful that you just have to persist with it. Um, and uh, th- these tactics will transform players. I think in some cases, maybe that will be true. I can see the logic behind that for certain players, but certain players just have severe limitations. I always come back to this. Like people always refer- reference Arteta, right? Sure, he done, he done a lot of good work at Arsenal, uh, but it was also based on signing some very good players along the way that helped him instill those those tactics a lot better. That's just like, that's not me having a go at Arteta. It's just, again, very basic football stuff. Like you, you look at uh, Pep Guardiola for all his brilliance. He has also, throughout his entirety of his career, been able to play that football with some of the greatest players we've ever seen. Um, and I just, I just fear that, again, it's like, are we going with a, a guy like Sanchez because aesthetically, and I, again, it goes back to the decision makers at Chelsea. Why have we suddenly gone in this positional play, possession-based football? Is it because it's the hip thing to do? Or is it because you're going to instill this across the club and it's going to be a coherent vision? Um, That's and- the biggest thing, isn't it? Because sometimes mm. you, you see clubs mould the squad to the manager but are you molding the manager to the squads in this case? And if case? that guy ain't going to be here, like, it, yeah. it's the funny thing about Chalibur and, uh, and I, I don't just want to step on what we're talking about in the transfers, but yeah. Cobham, the great thing about Cobham is it's produced very versatile players who can thrive in the chaos of Chelsea because they're educated in a way where they can play different styles and also different positions. It's why a guy like Chalabar has lasted as long as he has um, because he's able to adapt to different scenarios rather than when you buy a specialist player who can only play one style of play and in the moment that um, changes quickly at Chelsea, which it does pretty frequently, those players really struggle and become surplus to requirement. So um, I, I, I have deep fears about if Maresca is not going to be here that long, if he really struggles to adapt. Oh, if, a five plus one contract. Yeah, <laughs> five plus one contract. Dan's you know. taking me up beautifully here, by the way. We were going to t- touch on expectations. Is there, but do we have to provide a bit of balance in terms of maybe some reasons to be positive as a Chelsea fan? Because look, we, we have been yeah. quite, look, it's been down in the dumps here. I apologize. Yeah. If you're a Chelsea fan, you came in here thinking, you know what, we're, we're winning yeah. a lot. You're not going to be winning a lot of quarters. No, I'm going to predict we're going to win a league. Listen, yeah. <laughs> one reason to be positive each about Chelsea this season. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not just going to give you one reason. There is every chance that Chelsea finish in the top four this season. It's a great season. There's every chance that Chelsea finish 12th. It's just the, the variation is so much. And that's why Chelsea fans go into this season. And we have to hold corn from football fans online because, because of how badly our club is being run. But w- I would not be surprised to see Chelsea finish third or fourth this season. Because I think the first two spots are guaranteed in terms of Man City and Arsenal. The rest is up for grabs. Everybody else is in flux. Mm. Liverpool are in flux. Uh, Manchester United are in flux with a host of injuries again. Um, and, and Spurs, we don't know if they're going to kick on after last season. And so the reason to be optimistic is that apart from Man City and Arsenal, no, no, there's no other guarantees in the Premier League. And mm. Chelsea can well, it's well within their means to finish in the top four with the quality of players they've mm. got in the squad. It's whether they can all play under Maresca and really buy into his philosophy. Dan, what would represent a good season for Chelsea? Uh, Chelsea need to qualify for the Champions League. Mm-hmm. That's just that's just a reality. Um, I, I've even heard some people say that's unfair on Marissa. It's not unfair. Like it's not. That's just a reality. Like Chelsea, because of the amount they've spent, because of PSR, because of FFP, because of what they want to do, they need to start getting Champions League football pretty mm-hmm. quickly. Um, and also just to start for a fan perspective, to start seeing some results, like actual tangible things that are not just like nice media briefs about projects, like mm. actual tangible results that you can look at and go, okay, I can see some progression. And the positive is Cole Palmer. The, the, that, that, yeah. uh, and Nkunku, I'm, I, yeah. I think Nkunku is amazing if he can stay fit. 6.5 million on FPL. 
Bargain. Yeah, I, I, yeah. In Kunku, I, if, Join the milk carton. If Nkunku uh, stays <laughs> fit, I, I think he could be Chelsea's player of the season. Wasn't so gutting to see like last season. Remember preseason was great yeah. last year. Yeah. And the way that him and uh, Jackson were dovetailing, Nkunku gets injured, then he just never really recovered and couldn't find but the even consistency. Even in a small, like he barely played last year, but even in those small moments, quality. he scored a goal against Wolves, scored a really good goal against Liverpool. Liverpool yeah. And already in preseason, like he'd done a really amazing run. I think it was against Club America, yeah. which... I'd, I'd suggest go and watch it because it reminds me a bit of Hazard. I'm not, yeah. again, that's not me saying he's going to be Hazard because mm. he needs to stay fit first. Mm. Try to tell him the comments. Um, <laughs> but Cole, Cole Palmer, obviously, like, yeah. I, I just remember watching that Euros final and obviously as a Chelsea fan, it's like double celebration oh. when you see. What do you expect for him next season in terms of numbers? Because obviously he hit 22, yeah. 22 league goals and I think he got 10 assists. What would represent a good season for Paul, Cole Palmer next season? I, 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 don't, I don't expect him to hit the same numbers because I'd like to think that there's going to be shared responsibility. You'd hope so. Uh, because really it came to a point where it was just like, just pass the ball give, to give Cole. Give it to him. And to be honest, he'd done a lot of great work because of that. Um, yeah. Obviously, there's a big factor of... Maresca gave some good quotes about Cole that he said, um, you know, we just want him to be himself and he spoke about this. So my hope is that Maresca adapts mm -hmm. and understands that you don't, try and limit players like Cole Palmer. Um, they're a gift, right? And there's just, it, it, there's certain things about Cole Palmer that just make him one of the most extraordinary. So I'll give praise to the ownership, right? They have, that's one of the best pieces of business Chelsea have done in like a decade, right? Oh, in terms sure. of, so it's not that I'm going to sit here and say it's there's absolutely nothing good about Chelsea. Um, and Cole Palmer is one of the reasons to be hopeful, to be positive. If, if him, in Kunku, if Jackson picks up, if Romeo Lavia, I think could be a really good player for Chelsea that, as well. That's it, Jakey, right? Like, Obviously, I'm not a Chelsea fan here, but we're talking about expectations. I completely agree with you. I think there's Arsenal and City, and there's those two spots are pretty much locked down if they perform to the way that people expect. And then there's a bunch of clubs that haven't really figured out themselves yet, mm -hmm. who have a lot of talent, and Chelsea are definitely in that group of clubs because they have spent two years trying to sign or mop up like most of the best young players in the world. It's now about can we actually get these players performing to their potential and hitting heights like Cole Palmer does? Because if you have 11 of those players hitting heights like he does in their various positions with various, like what they need to do in the team, then you have a really, really good team. Mm -hmm. But it's about making sure that all that comes together. Scott, where do you think Chelsea will finish? Because And let us know in the comment section as well where you think Chelsea will finish. I, I, prediction, Jakey, I need to line this up now because we're going to do like previews and like predictions yeah. and stuff. I need to kind of line this up. You put me on the spot. Okay, then... Dan Quaker is it's sort of a gut feeling. I'll, I'll go you... fourth or fifth. Okay, you said the expectation should be Champions League. Where, yeah. Do you believe you will get that? Not, not entirely. No. The way he looked no. at me, Quake like, has um, got two predictions. He's got fourth or twelfth. <laughs> um, I do think. I think we'll finish fourth. Think okay. Finish fourth. I'll go fifth. I, I, you know, I'll go fifth now. Okay. Big. Any final comments on Chelsea that we wanted to mention? Let's be optimistic, man. Chelsea have got a great history when it comes to Italian managers. Obviously, Vialli was incredible um, or had incredible times on Vialli, the first Chelsea mm. manager I remember. Obviously, Ranieri was very good for Conte, Ancelotti. Mm. We've had, obviously, Sarri Sorry. trophies, trophies <laughs> as well. So, Di Matteo? Di Matteo won mm. the Champions League. So we've had, we've had a kind of romance when it comes to Italian players and managers. And I hope that Maresca's he follows in that lineage but talking to some Leicester fans it doesn't seem like it's going to be the case but I, I'm optimistic man this is a time of the season where you're allowed to be optimistic as a football fan the previous season has gone new season hasn't started yet you're allowed to be optimistic so Chelsea fans just need to band together and just hope that we don't get turned over my man seat in the first game of the season <laughs> Dan what would, would be your message to the Chelsea fans watching this I'll just be excited about the Conference League. I, I just, I can't, and that's not, that's not even sarcastic. No, 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 I, I, I love Conference it. League is the best chance of silverware Chelsea have had and Clear Lake have to actually put something out there as like some form of success. Yes, no one's going to be sitting there and going, this is the greatest European, because Chelsea, unlike some other London clubs, you know, we, we have some great European heritage. <laughs> um, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to yeah. say it. Harry's off camera. Yeah. Yeah. It's gone. <laughs> Up the <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for that, and, and not just because of you know the chance of winning something at the end of the season. I think it's also for the young players that could that we haven't sold yet that could actually you know be be used in that competition very smartly so yeah that's you get to see some cities you never ever thought you'd see oh there's gonna be some great away trips some great away, away trips amazing. great away tour with the son of chelsea thanks so much to dan thanks so much to quake you scott and well i'm not gonna say thanks to myself but make sure to leave a lock of the way Thank out you, Jakey. please subscribe to 90 min if you as scott said we're gonna have plenty more club focused videos on the way uh digging deeper into the biggest clubs in the premier league let us know what you think in the comment section below let us know where you think chelsea will finish and we'll see you in the next one take care guys